Okay, I think we'll get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's discussion, which will focus on what's next for Kazakhstan and the rest of Central Asia following the early January events. My name is Justin Burke, and I'm the publisher of Eurasianet, which along with Columbia's Harriman Institute is co-sponsoring this event. A measure of stability is now returned to Kazakhstan, but what exactly is the new normal? The bout of violence raised a lot of questions that remain unanswered. How firm is President Tokayev's grip on power? How serious is the government's commitment to addressing economic inequality? What effect will political infighting have on the country's economy? How have the January events changed the CSTO? And what's the impact on Kazakhstan's multi-vector foreign policy? There's a lot to discuss and we'll try to cover all the bases during our discussion. We've assembled a great panel to help us make sense of what's happened and what's to come. Our first speaker will be Joanna Lillis. Joe is an editor at large for Eurasianet. She is also the author of Dark Shadows Inside the Secret World of Kazakhstan. Joe will be followed by Peter Leonard. Peter is Eurasianet's Central Asia editor. He's been reporting the news from every nook and cranny of Central Asia for well over a decade. Colleen Wood is a PhD candidate in the political science department at Columbia. She'll be our third speaker. Colleen is writing her thesis on civil society and social movements in Kazakhstan. Our final speaker today will be Alex Cooley. Alex just completed two terms as Harriman's director and he should be enjoying his sabbatical, but he has agreed to join us today. Thank you very much, Alex. We'll be following the usual format. Each expert will talk for about 10 minutes. Then my co-host, Elise Giuliano, who directs the program on US-Russia relations at the Harriman, will moderate a discussion. We ask that you submit questions via Zoom. With that, we'll begin. Joe, please lead us off. Hi, good evening from Kazakhstan and um, good morning to all of you in uh, America. Um, thank you very much to the Haraman Institute and Eurasianet for organizing this event today. It's very important um, that we have the time and space to discuss what's happening in Kazakhstan because, you know, what, what we've seen happening in the last, well, three weeks or so um, has been absolutely momentous for Kazakhstan. And of course, it has wider implications for the Central Asian region and um, geopolitical implications as well, given that we've had foreign troops, Russian troops and troops from other regional states on the ground in Kazakhstan and, um, until recently, which is quite, um, you know, a radical step um, for a sovereign state to take um, in the former Soviet Union, especially given Russia's saber rattling in Ukraine. Um, so I think the first thing I should um, start by saying is that um, here we are more than three weeks are on after all this started. And we, we really do have more questions than answers about what really happened. Um, and I think um, it's important to state early on uh, that the reason for that is because of the obfuscation of President Kasim Jomar Tokayev and his government about what they really think happened. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but I think um, it's important to uh, point out, um, especially given uh, we've seen, you know, a lot of media shorthand, which is inevitable as journalists, we're forced to resort to shorthand to explain complex events. But, you know, what we're seeing at the moment is how, how peaceful protests turn violent in Kazakhstan and so on, and how the authorities, um, the security forces shot peaceful peaceful protesters. I think that's two overriding nav narratives that we're seeing, especially in the Western media. Well, first of all, the peaceful protests, I, I would like to say, did not turn violent. They were turned violent. Um, there is no question, I think, that, what, that um, first of all, that these uh, demonstrations began as genuine, spontaneous, grassroots, peaceful protests, beginning in the troubled town of Zhangozen, where almost exactly a decade ago, security forces shot um, civilians dead, striking oil workers and unarmed protesters. Um, so I, I, I would call that the most troubled town in Kazakhstan. That's where it all began. What did it all begin with? Well, it began with a socio-economic grievance over price rises and a sort of obscure fuel price rise, but not obscure to the people whose pocket this hits. Um, 
Now, the protests, um, as we know, they snowballed, but the grievances that were voiced in Zhang Ozen were the same grievances, pretty much, that were then voiced all the way around the country, right down to Almaty, before things turned really violent. Um, so, starting with those socioeconomic grievances, um, a fuel price rise. The government um, immediately caved in and, and put the price of fuel back down, reintroduced uh, subsidies temporarily. But as usual in these situations, when the government's faced with protests, it doesn't understand the people. In fact, that's why it starts with the protest. That's why it ends up with protests, because it takes measures that it really doesn't understand um, how that will affect ordinary people. Um, the grievances, other grievances, immediately voiced inflation, unemployment, um, underemployment, low salaries, high prices, corruption, all of these things have been voiced at protests in Kazakhstan for years and years and years. I mean, we can certainly date all this back to Zhang Ozen, if not before. So for 10 years, people have been going out and telling the government our lives are not what we expect from you, for, uh, you to deliver for us in this oil rich state. Um, politically, um, it's very, very notable how quickly the protests turned political, even though they started on one um, socio-economic grievance. And I think we reported that right from the beginning at, uh, on Eurasianet, that people in Zhang Ozen had started voicing political demands quite quickly, very quickly. Um, it started with, uh, we want to elect our town and regional governors, not have them appointed. We want them accountable to us, not to people up the chain, kowtowing up the chain. Um, this is something that's been, um, you know, that, that 20 years ago, opposition politi politicians were telling us about that was needed. Again, they didn't listen. Um, and um, of course, um, I think probably many people listening know that the slogan of the protest soon became Shalkyet. That means in Kazakh, old man out or old man go. And of course, it refers to Nazarbayev. We've heard it at protests um, in Kazakhstan since 2014. In fact, I, I think at Eurasianet, we reported on um, the first, if, if, not, if not the first, then one of the first times it was heard was at an anti-devaluation protest in 2014. And I remember being very shocked that the protesters were being so outspoken and knowing that that was not going to go down well. What I didn't know was that that, that slogan would stick, that people would keep on chanting it more and more and more, and they would continue to chant it after Nazarbayev resigned, because uh, in, in their minds, or in reality, he hadn't left. Um, they wanted him to go, he hadn't left, he had his ha his uh, hand on the, uh, his, his iron fist on the helm, if you like. So people have been chanting that, pro that slogan for, what, seven, eight years. And, um, you know, and it's come to this. Um, so um, political demands. But of course, um, it's also worth pointing out that that slogan has quite a while ago in, sort of taken on a different meaning. Uh, when people chant, shall get old man out, they don't mean only the old man anymore. They mean the entire political establishment, the morally bankrupt, unaccountable, self-serving, corrupt political establishment that has ruled them for 30 years. And at this point, many of them have in mind also Tokayev with his listening state that he promised them when he came to power in 2019. So it's clear that there was a lot of um, problems um, for the government. You know, these protests that got out of hand so quickly or at least snowballed peacefully, um, and from the government's point of view, that's already tantamount to getting out of hand. They, um, they, the protesters were asking for things that have been constantly voiced on the streets, in meetings, on the internet, on social media, openly, vocally. Uh, people have been asking the government to solve these problems, and the government or the authorities under Nazarbayev and under Tokayev have done virtually nothing to um, do that. So. Um, as for, so the peaceful protests were about demands that people have been making for many, many years. Um, now, the question of it turning violent, certainly the police, uh, when things, uh, when marches reached Republic Square in Almaty, and uh, I think probably tens of thousands of them, or certainly thousands, uh, police did use tear gas and um, stun grenades against peaceful protesters. But the violence really began um, when um, violent elements came into the city and hijacked uh, these peaceful protests for their own ends. And I think the government, that's very clearly the government's narrative, but it does certainly seem to, to hold water, let's say. I mean, our own um, Chris Rickleton, uh, who reports for Eurasian Ed, witnessed um, an organized sort of um, three-pronged uh, approach to Republic, Republic Square on the 5th of January, um, clearly organized by people armed with all kinds of, of sticks and so on. Um, so certainly, but the question is, um, well, there are two questions. Did the, um, the security uh, forces fire on peaceful protesters or on these, um, these mobs, these bandits, these terrorists, as the 
uh, calls them. Eyewitnesses say that at certain points they did fire on pe peaceful protesters. Tokayev obviously denies that. Um, the question arises, of course, who were these people? Well, um, Tokayev, um, you know, has been very has been very um, angry about uh, what he sees as biased media coverage about criticism of this firing on peaceful protesters, saying that these people were not peaceful. Um, but all he has come out with to explain who they were was that they were terrorists and bandits. And that is basically it. So we're supposed to believe that 20,000 terrorists and bandits uh, suddenly appeared. They'd been in sleeper cells, according to Tokayev. He, we can't produce all of their bodies because their militants stole them from morgues. Um, and apparently they came down from somewhere and um, started creating havoc in Almaty. Tokayev says in order to uh, mount a coup d'etat, which obviously failed after he called in Russia, after he faced it off, whatever. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think um, the fact that we, we, we can see an element of organization in orchestrated seizures of, uh, sort of strategic facilities and also eyewitness reports saying that um, the, the, many of these groups were in groups of five with one leader and then the groups of five were also in the group of, of five, so 25 working together to do all kinds of things, including seize the airport, broadcasting facilities, attack police stations. So definitely an element of organization. But where does Tokayev's um, narrative um, stop standing up? Well, um, just the very idea that these terrorists had, had come and wanted to mount a coup d'etat, but why, who were they, and so on. Well, so much haziness about this. And the only reason I can think of to explain that vagueness, that haziness, is there is something Tokayev doesn't want to tell us. Um, and, you know, I mean, there has been well, well, um, it's well documented that rumors have been circulating in Kazakhstan that members of Nazarbayev's family have, were involved in fomenting trouble, whether to create chaos, whether to topple Tokayev. Um, certainly the rumors um, have been published in the media. The government has slapped them down, threatened legal action against media publishing them. They've been widely discussed on social media. The names of two of Nazarbayev's nephews have been floated. Samat Abish, which recently dismissed as deputy security chief and his brother, Pirat Satibaldi, the name of Nazarbayev's brother, Bolat Nazarbayev, is constantly uh, being circulated, especially amid reports of, of his businesses being taken away from him today. Um, and so um, I guess I've come to my 10 minutes. Uh, so what I would like to say, um, if, if I can just take another 30 seconds, is one, Tokayev is not telling us the whole truth. And the only reason we can see for that is because he believes he won't be able to, he, he can't, um, he's not able, there were people too powerful for him to point the finger at, perhaps, let's say. Um, and number two, uh, we're hearing absolutely rampant reports, and I've interviewed um, people myself, of detainees who are held in uh, detention centers who are suffering from the most grotesque forms of torture. Um, and this suggests that, you know, the quest for justice is, is going to be, well, justice is going to be very elusive if uh, they're relying on torture to make their own narrative stand up. So I think there's a lot to unpack there, but I would just say that, yeah, those are the points that I would like to make. The point being that Tokayev wants to move on here. Well, first of all, another point, sorry, very quickly, the list of the dead not released. Why not? The only people we're hearing from are relatives of people who sound like very ordinary people, either peaceful protesters or innocent bystanders or whatever. Um, but uh, the point being that Tokayev says, you know, he's going to reform Kazakhstan, but if he starts it on the basis of a lie or a partial truth, I think his prospects of success are rather hazy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. Those were, uh, that's a very interesting insight. So Peter, uh, please, uh, what can you add to that? Uh, yes, I, I will like, um uh to kind of uh, um move forward um because this is now the kind of the the theme because joe is correct in saying that um in the um uh early days of um the unrest obviously everything was focused on on what was happening at that time and so uh everything was was uh, was to do with, with trying to unpack the the, the causes and wherefores of uh, specifically what was happening on on kind of a, as a, as a, um, 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 in terms of the security situation, but now um, increasingly the talk is is quite different things altogether. So Tokayev, uh, whenever he speaks in public, 
stereotypically tends to talk about much more about the socio-economic situation in the country. And, and there's some really interesting things to um, uh, think about in terms of what he's saying. And most notably, a speech he gave on uh, January the 21st to a Congress of the country's entrepreneurs. Um, and it was a, a downright sort of um, Bolshevik speech down to him referring to the entrepreneurs as uh, and he called them the, the national bourgeoisie, which is not a term you normally hear from um, uh, yeah, presidents in this day and age. But, but he brought up a few um, quite startling statistics that one does not tend to hear from, uh, uh, well, from, from the president of Kazakhstan. One being that um, the income of uh, half of uh, uh, Kazakhs does not exceed 50,000 tenge a month. That's $115. Uh, um, more uh, stark, but 162 people um, hold half of the wealth of Kazakhstan. Um, he, he painted a picture of, of, um, of stark inequality, and he um, was also quite clear about who he um, saw to blame for this, which was the, um, the business class of the country, uh, who he said had not uh, sufficiently reinvested into uh, diversifying Kazakhstan. Um, he continues to make um, uh, not very veiled references to money being taken abroad. And so he made a comment of the, of the, of the type, um, you know, if you want to continue living in Kazakhstan, then, you know, think about um, investing in your own country, that sort of thing. Um, these are all kind of coded, not so coded uh, references, obviously, to uh, the former ruling family, um, because you say 62 people own half of the wealth of Kazakhstan. Of those 62 people, you can be certain that um, a good number of them are represented by Azerbaijan's either relatives or uh, so-called bagmen um, or people who have been you know, politically loyal to him. Um, not all of them by any means, but uh, a very considerable number. So, so the, 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 the temperatures changed very considerably in, uh, in, in Kazakhstan. Um, and I think that that is where Tokayev for the time being wants to see the conversation going. I mean, all of the points that Joe made are obviously very important, but, but I, I kind of feel that as far as the um, official rhetoric is going, that that stuff is going to sort of, including all the talk of terrorists is going to sort of slowly slip into the background. My sense is that um, maybe there's a bit of embarrassment, quite frankly, about um, some of Tokayev's more wild assertions in the early days. I, I get the feeling maybe he was kind of perhaps talking more off the cuff than, than anything. But so, yeah, so we kind of we're seeing this um, this stated intention to reformat um, the, the economic kind of social model, uh, more welfare, um, more. Um, let's say, reliance on, on uh, well, more diversification. And, and this, this diversification is going to be, um, the, the business community is going to be tasked with pursuing that. And the point of diversification is obviously that um, uh, the reason for the sort of dismal disparity of the, uh, the kind of quality of work which is available to Kazakh workers is, is generally a very kind of narrow type. You know, it's either your kind of your laborer, um, and then a very small class of sort of aspiring middle class sort of uh, office workers, state workers, uh, who are paid really very miserable salaries typically. And then, then you kind of, you quickly run out of categories to name. And so um, that I think is, is going to be kind of the, the recurring kind of, uh, theme. Um, but there's all these sort of other kind of plates to keep spinning at the same time for to go. So he's going to have to uh, address not just the socio-economic reform agenda, but also the political reform agenda. In theory, the political reform agenda, he, you know, in a kind of properly, author properly authoritarian state, you might be able to sort of dispense with that. And there's a nice, except for the moment that we've just had. Tokayev has had a, a major reckoning. He's coming to understand that um, the times of, of, of sort of fake consensus of sort of everyone kind of, um, uh, you know, just agreeing to things just because the president has said so and, and, uh, and everyone's agreed to it um, is, is over. So this is not to say that, you know, a, a season of democracy is upon us, 
it's to say that a season of pretending that uh, democracy is upon us is upon us, um, which is to say that um, I think there's going to be kind of some kind of I, su I suspect a kind of half um, half genuine, half uh, 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 sincere, but but half insincere, probably more than half insincere. Um, attempt to kind of create a kind of a simulation of, 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 uh, of national dialogue, of, 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 um, of, of instituting a new parliament which will be more representative. Um, incidentally, on this point, uh, tomorrow um, will be the um, uh, meeting of the political council of Nurotan, the ruling party, which is the kind of communist party style beer moth, which essentially is sort of, yeah, I mean, the, the center of policy, supposedly, although not really, um, in Kazakhstan. So they're going to have their political council meeting tomorrow and then the, um, the general congress the day after that. And the expectation is that um, they will pick a new chairman. The chairman was until now uh, the former president, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who has recently declared himself a pension. So he, he will be at his picture. So there's a big kind of question mark as to who is going to uh, take over there. There's an even bigger question mark on whether this political party is going to continue to exist. There's strong suspicions that uh, they may dissolve it. And already we're seeing a lot of news items coming out every day of people tearing, not tearing up literally, but, but um, uh, resigning their membership in the party. Um, so the future of that party I think, is very much in doubt. What does that mean? It means that um, the, the likelihood is that, that, that some sort of parliamentary election uh, will be, well, parliamentary election will be called in the relatively near future, I suspect, and that a new form of parliament, will, a new look at new look parliament, will be will be um, elected. I mean, the problem is who's going to be elected to that parliament. Uh, there's a big question mark on that, which I, which I can address later. So, and then and then um, the final points. I realise I'm running out of time, but the the uh, final point I did want to make though is that um, the, the the issue I think we have to um, really keep in mind here is, is why are all these things uh, that uh, Joe spoke about, all the many kind of uh, shortcomings and, and kind of egregious uh, uh, um, sort of instances of bad governance uh, allowed to perpetuate over such a long period. This is quite simply to do with the feedback me mechanism, which simply does not exist in Kazakhstan. Um, and it's a bit of a sort of a truism to say that Janet Ozen, where these protests began, is very far away. But it's 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 not just a literal truth. I mean, it's it's a kind of a figurative truth in that anything outside kind of the immediate um, uh, circle of, of of Kazakhstan's rulers it seems is is kind of out of earshot of, of the people who are taking the decisions. And this is a, a catastrophic failure of the uh, of the Kazakh state in ways that even other author authoritarian states, like, for instance, neighboring Russia, has a kind of an ability to, to you know, uh, cycle information and to process uh, sort of national um, you know, uh, sentiments. Kazakhstan just lacks that completely, uh, be it because um, there's no such thing as an independent media, not that there's a very strong independent media scene in Russia, but it's considerably, considerably weaker in Kazakhstan. But but on top of that, the kind of the, the the incentive to sort of falsify the message is much stronger in Kazakhstan. In fact, it's sort of supercharged by by government incentives, so that the government actually pays newspapers, even privately owned ones, to run state endorsed news. Essentially, and this system does not allow. Um, it, it simply doesn't allow uh, people running to get any kind of sense of what's happening out there in the, in the, in the hinterland. And, and that is what has done for um, Kazakhstan over and over again, or Kazakhstan's rulers, I should say. So that's what's happened on this occasion. This is this was a problem they could have seen coming from a mile away if they'd had eyes to see. The problem they had in 2016, the largest protest Kazakhstan had seen before then, uh, there were land protests. There was, you know, it was a very um, trivial trigger in the end. And there was a, Change to legislation about land, which was slightly kind of misinterpreted by by um, activists who kind of came out and protested, possibly intentionally. Um, but you know, this was something that I was writing about weeks before the protests began. I mean, I knew about it before they did. In the sense, I knew that kind of this had potential to um, be something that was kind of 
angering and anger kind of people on the ground. And yet somehow this, there's a, something missing in the, the information loop of, of Kazakhstan's leadership. And so um, that aspect, I think, is probably going to be uh, looked at. Whether it's going to be addressed efficiently, well, conscientiously, I mean, that's another matter. I have my doubts, so it's my kind of job to be a professional skeptic. Um, but um, I think understanding that dynamic is also, I think, very key to getting to the bottom of, of uh, what's happened to Kazakhstan this month. Um, so I'll just end on that. Note. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Um, indeed, context and the past is important. And I think uh, Colleen or, or Wood, our next speaker, will have a lot to say about that. You've been researching. Uh, these questions for a long time. So Colleen, please uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Um, wow, Joanna and Peter really covered a lot of ground that um, I had written down on my notes. So I want to try to weave some of their commentary and really thorough um, analysis of situating the grievances in a much broader arc of a social movement and try to um, kind of look at the ways that Tokayev's theory of governance is not really going to um, to meet the expectations and demands of people that are really tapped into the civil society space, but also more average citizens. Um, and I think that something that Peter said, this comment that Dokayev was embarrassed about the way that he described the protesters as bandits and terrorists, um, I think really speaks to this Jekyll and Hyde communication strategy that Tokayev has managed um, both to domestic and to international audiences in, in almost the same breath. He calls um, his citizens terrorists. He allows for soldiers to open fire at anyone with, with no real cause and turns around in 12 hours later, calls for a commission to facilitate communication between state and society. And this type of commission we've seen over and over and over again, not just by Tokayev, but also by um, Nazarbayev before him. And I think from the perspective of Tokayev, this type of commission is just one example of the super cosmetic reforms that illustrate his theory of the listening state. So when Tokayev won the election in June 2019, his first big speech to the nation was in September, and he announces that the way forward is that Kazakhstan's government really just needs to be a listening state. We are here to listen to your grievances. We're here to then do something about it. Um, however, as Peter really thoroughly explained, there, there is not a real mechanism uh, for Kazakhstan's elites to um, understand the grievances on the ground and actually um, enforce changes. And I think that this frustration with the hollowness of the listening state um, is worth then looking at another sense, um, which I explore in my dissertation, and that's visibility. Um, and so what I want to talk about is um, the internet and social media as a space for visibility and the government's response to the protests, um, specifically the decision to shut down the internet in Almaty and in all other cities in Kazakhstan for um, around a week, what the implications of visibility are for the likelihood that Tokayev's listening state can really survive much longer. Um, so my research explores the way that um, activists, human rights defenders, um, and NGOs use social media in order to push back against government narratives. And, and visibility is really a huge thing there. Being able to take a photograph of a protest of a poster of someone who has been beaten in detention uh, is a really striking way to shift average people's understanding of the government's narrative. Seeing on TV that Tokayev says, you know, the Kazakh government is reforming, we're trying to do better. And then scrolling on your phone and seeing a forwarded image of, of someone who's been beaten in detention, that dissonance is really productive for civil society and productive for activists. Um, and so it was really jarring then that the government shut down one of the only means of counter visibility or counter imaging that um, average people had. Um, one of the things that I heard all the time from, from English teachers in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan was the phrase, no news is good news, which maybe it's just not an American phrase, but I've never heard that. And I think that what we've seen from, from the really awful events in Kazakhstan is that indeed no news is not good news. It is very, very bad news. Um, that without any news, without any 
images of what was happening in the protest. And really we saw that Telegram, Instagram, Facebook would have been spaces to disseminate images of what these crowds look like, of how police are responding to them and of what the consequences of, the, of violence are for average people. By shutting that down, you, Tokayev and, and state authorities were really able to um, block a mechanism of, of these um, protests building, both from the perspective of violence, but also from the perspective of average people realizing that a lot of people think like them and are willing to take the risk of going out on the street. Um, and Joanna did a really great job of explaining the extent of the violence, although it's really difficult to pinpoint precisely what exactly has happened because the government blocked the internet, there is no independent media and they're not releasing any lists. But um, I think it's also important to emphasize that protests that were happening in manga style region, so the one in the far west where Jean Zen is, where these other oil towns are, um, as Almaty was locked down, as CSTO soldiers are patrolling the streets, shooting citizens, protests continued in Octao, Atirao, Jean Zen. Crowds of up to a thousand people were gathered in these cities for days and days after the violence started reading political poems, uh, passing around a microphone and, and speaking out their demands. Um, and I think that the fact that those protests continued but weren't really able to be shared or images and videos of them weren't able to be shared um, was a way to, to make people really afraid. And it, rightfully so, the, the situation in Almaty was awful. Um, activists that I have interviewed and that I've worked with in, in the city are terrified, they're traumatized, they're scared. Um, however, um, I think that the um, this fear though is the intention of the state to really clamp down on Almaty was another tactic of visibility for the government um, that the really harsh response to Almaty and the randomness of violence in, in other cities in the country is a way for Cossack authorities to basically send a signal to any other town or urban center that has thoughts that they would want to organize similarly. Like, this is what will happen to you if you act like Almaty, that um, the kind of the visual signal of this violence is a tactic for the state. However, um, I guess I'll end on a somewhat positive note um, that even though activists and rights defenders are traumatized, they also have been organizing. And I've really been struck by the minute that internet turned back on, what I was seeing in Instagram posts wasn't even, I'm okay, I'm doing okay. It was people sharing resources. Do you need food? Do you need free psychological counseling? Do you need um, batteries? Do you need um, a place to stay? Do you need someone to call your parents to make sure that they're okay in their town? That this really dense network of care and solidarity is really densely knit across Kazakhstan. Um, and I think was the most promising thing that I've, I've seen and a tiny nugget of hope moving forward is that the state's goals to crack down on this social movement, I think it will work to a certain extent. I don't think that we're going to be seeing mass protests anytime soon, but I think that the, the spirit of these demands and the networks of solidarity do give us something to look forward to in, in, in the near future that there is some leverage from the bottom up to, to have a say in what Tukayev is going to be doing and trying to do these cosmetic reforms at the political level. Um, and I think that the final hopeful note is, you know, even though these people were activists are terrified on January 14th, we already saw the first kind of political action. Was that a, a group of activists associated with Oyan Kazakhstan? So the, this was the group that kind of formed right before the presidential elections in 2019 that um, they decided that they wanted to do an anonymous action of, of unveiling a huge banner, kind of a tactic that we've seen over and over in the years, but a banner that it was demanding the resignation of Almaty City's Akim or mayor, um, Slaginbayev. Um, and it just so happened that, you know, a car was driving by, saw the people unveiling this banner, things escalate, he's arrested. Um, but I think that the the bravery and courage that it took to go back out in Almaty after the, the level of violence and the level of violence targeted specifically at this group of people is, is incredible and, and tells us that um, the social movement is not done, that this arc is not over. So I'll pass it over um, to Alex and I look forward to question and answer. Thank you very much, Colleen. So Alex, the big question is, is this the end of the beginning? Yeah, right. I wish I knew. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you to Harriman and Eurasianet for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be on with Colleen and Pete 
and Joe. Uh, I, I want to turn to the regional and global implications, some of which have been talked about, some maybe not so much, and that intersect with some various random research projects I've I've been involved with um, over the years. The first is, you know, the overall regional significance of the CSTO intervention, right? So I think it would be helpful to look at the CSTO, not just as a kind of collective security organization, not just, you know, an instrument um, that Vladimir Putin has to, you know, intervene in, you know, former satellite states, if you want to use that language, but really as a central mechanism of Russia's regional ordering efforts, right? And by ordering, I mean the institutions, the norms, the kinds of architectures that are deployed um, to exert influence um, in the region. CSTO has been around for decades, but this is the first time um, it has intervened. Member states have requested that the CSTO intervene before, most notably Armenia uh, during the 2020 resumed Karabakh conflict, but also 2021 when there were Azeri incursions on their Armenian borders, um, the group refused. And um, in 2010, after the power vacuum in Kyrgyzstan following the collapse of the Bakiyev government, um, uh, then acting premier Rosa Tambayeva requested that the CSTO intervene to sort of quell um, ethnic clashes in the south of the country. And again, then President Medvedev refused. And so the perception had grown in the West, especially the Western kind of think tank community that this was a talk shop. Um, it was an empty organization. It was just virtual, didn't do anything. It was a joke, right? All of these terms have been used before. Um, what you had here was like a tailor-made scenario for the intervention. And incidentally, the reason that you know, Russia didn't approve of these interventions. It didn't want to get involved, either in local conflicts between two states in the Caucasus or in Central Asia, right? <laughs> no way it wanted to actually take sides. Yeah, it gave some legal reasons and so forth, but, but really this is a political consideration. Kazakhstan, on the other hand, checked every box for Putin. Putin didn't cook this up. He didn't prefabricate this, but opportunistically, he took full advantage of this. That is, it really seemed that order had collapsed um, that Takayev could not rely on his security services. He didn't know what was going on. And this quick decision, first of all, was unprecedented, right? That after an overnight consultation, Putin and Lukashenko sign off on this. The troops are deployed. Uh, they symbolically, uh, 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 you know, uh, go to sort of these strategic assets, high profile, Amati Airport, Baikonur, this Cosmodrome, uh, and so forth. But there is a signaling effect here that Moscow backs to Kyiv, backs the status quo, right? And so any wavering security services, police, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, security services bureaucrats, um, you know, take note, right? And that's that's quite important. But that's consistent with this kind of ordering effect that the nature of the CSDO is to preserve. Um, status quo regimes. Some would even say autocratic rule. There's been some interesting work, political science here, Roy Allison, um, you know, uh, Stefan Aris, um, so uh, Anastasia Bidenkova. So uh, uh, it's, it's a regional organization, but if we look at it through kind of NATO eyes, it's not going to make sense. If we look at it as a preserver of stability, of status quo regimes, um, of uh, kind of uh, uh, this, 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 uh, you know, uh, orbit in Eurasia, then it does make sense. Um, contrary to sort of predictions that this was undermining Kazakhstan's sovereignty and that this would be a big kind of noose around sort of Takayev's neck, um, the very quick intervention and sort of departure of the troops, actually what I think was another kind of propaganda win for Putin, um, you know, mission accomplished and so forth. Um, uh, so, you know, overall, even the framing of this, right? So Putin framed the justification of this as, um, you know, countering another color revolution, right? Same as sort of Chinese uh, uh, going in and, and sort of this external interference nondescript. But again, that's part of the script of, again, the ordering dynamics of the region. Um, so it's, it, it is um, uh, important. Now, what are the implications for multivectorism? It's my second point. Um, you know, we use this term a lot. It's almost sort of an axiom. All the Central Asian states like to pursue multi-vector foreign policies. So I wrote a book about this, multi-vectorism in the 2000s. Um, um, but here's the critical point. 
Um, Central Asia has been trending away from multivectorism for the last six, seven years anyway, right? Um, because of increased engagement by Russia and China um, due to the fallout of Crimea since 2004 and because of the Belt and Road and its implications and then the camps in Xinjiang um, in the Chinese case. And the US uh, has been perceived as withdrawing and then actually withdrew earlier this year, right? So this kind of elusive balance that all the Central Asian states seem to strike that's been out of tilt for some while, right? Um, and I know there's a debate now, will Kazakhstan's multivectorism sort of change ultimately? Um, never estimate, underestimate the importance of a crisis situation to a regime, right? And so, you know, for me, um, it would seem absolutely logical that um, there is some sort of debt that's owed to Putin. It's not going to be overt, right? You know, <laughs> Takayev is not going to a sign over publicly oil concessions or something major, that's not how it's gonna happen. But here's some things to look out for. In a few months, will we see the establishment of a joint CSTO facility? You know, a stabilizing facility or an intelligence gathering facility, that's one. Two, um, what is Kazakhstan's position gonna be on the Ukraine crisis, right? Um, in a similar sort of pattern, after Putin unequivocally backed Lukashenko, um, from the 2020 protests, Lukashenko stopped playing this brokering role um, on Ukraine, right? Um, and in fact, um, you know, the, Moscow had been quite irritated at him for some while, right? For not heavily backing the Kremlin line. And now it's just the opposite. Now we're probably going to see the territory of Belarus used um, for the looming operation. Um, Kazakhstan, as well as all the other Central Asian states, have avoided, like the plague, taking a stance on Ukraine, right? So <laughs> the Kyrgyz and the Tajiks missed the UN vote. They didn't even vote. It's not that they even sort of abstained. Um, but I think that's going to be telling us. Um, and there are, you know, some other sort of other kind of symbolic things we can look for, um, you know, whether they'll acquiesce to an international commission, you know, what are the status of some of the Western financed you know, uh, NGOs and groups on the ground, you know, and so forth. The CSTO does keep a common list of, of threats, which it hasn't been able to agree on in the past, a la sort of SEO. It'll be interesting if that comes out. So there's a number of things behind the scenes uh, that might be going on. But this is absolutely significant in the sense that Kazakhstan was always perceived to be the super stable, skillfully played, multi-vector diplomacy. And so the regional effects here in a, in, in a region that is all about demonstration effects um, is, is, is quite, um, uh, quite important. My final point, if that's about kind of ordering and kind of you know, geopolitics, different kind of governing structures, my final point concerns sort of this aspect of de-Nazarbayification that's intriguing to me. And that is, um, you know, how, uh, you know uh, how contained is this gonna be just to Kazakhstan? And my initial guess is this can get quite messy quite soon. We have members of the family um, who are now reported living in exile, right? Or having been in exile. So Nazarbayev sort of kind of read very awkwardly the script. He's just a pensioner now, sort of stepping down. And Undoubtedly, there's been some sort of pacted transition, right? And the pact of the transition it probably is along the lines of, you know, hand over some of the important kinds of, you know, symbolically important assets, position, we'll audit the sovereign wealth fund, you know, the business associations, you know, step down from sort of these key posts, and we'll leave you and your family alone. That's the optimistic scenario. Here's the problem. The problem is no one knows how much money, how much wealth the Nazarbayev family has actually stashed abroad. No one knows, not Takayev, uh, not the you know, prosecutor general, not the Ministry of Finance, no one knows because they have made it a point of their last decades to hire dozens and dozens of intermediaries and consultants to hide, <laughs> right? And so this is now the really important question, right? Can there be a credible pact without knowing the full extent of how many assets are there. And you know, just to give you a sense of the universe of things, just look at the latest eight OCCRP investigation. There's gonna be a follow-up. Um, four foundations, right? Uh, founded by Nazarbayev controlling $8 billion, right? Not clear at all who they're accountable to, what the reporting requirements are. You know, one of them, you know, registered abroad uh, uh, and so forth. So uh, the, the more and more, disclosures there are about family holdings overseas, uh, the more incentives there are for jostling elites um, to go after. Um, the other extreme, how bad can it get? 
I invoke the Abliasov model, not because Abliasov is ever going to be compared to Nazarbayev, but in the Abliasov case, you had the Kazakh state really go after um, you know, these, these holdings ab abroad at great, great expense to it, right? Uh, employing you know, lawyers, litigation, PR firms, and so forth. Um, and the family is vulnerable, right? That's the other part of this. They're vulnerable in part because of our extraterritorial uh, kinds of anti-corruption tools. So Dariga Nazarbayeva um, successfully beat back an unexplained wealth order case in the UK on the basis that the evidence shown was that she did not illegally acquire um, her wealth. But a lot of that evidentiary basis was provided by the government of Kazakhstan. Now imagine a scenario in which the dossier that's sent forward um, to the NCA or some other forum um, has all the details of insider deals, right? And sort of illegal and things that have happened. Um, that's one. US side is really interesting too, right? It used to be the case that, you know, when Kazakhate was being prosecuted and investigated, um, Department of Justice kept a complete wall of separation of what was going on there versus the executive branch. And Nazarbayev reportedly time and time again would go to Bush, would go to Cheney and say, can't you just make this case go away? And they would say, no, we have this wall of separation. What we're seeing now with anti-corruption being elevated um, to a national security priority is they have to work out how this input is going to work. Do you sanction the Nazarbayevs? If so, um, what are the implications of this, right? Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, what kinds of you know assets and holdings do you go after? This is a real challenge, I would say, uh, for the Biden administration and anti-corruption agenda, because just exactly how do you incorporate in foreign policy? And the danger is that you potentially become involved in, in this inter-ethnic, or rather, right, this inter-elite um, dispute under the guise of sort of pursuing uh, uh, anti-corruption. So. Um, my, my whole kind of you know, point here is that um, this is gonna play out, I think, over a number of months, over a number of years. And it's not at all clear um, whether um, kind of the starting pact is really where we're gonna end in the end because no one actually knows just the, you know, the scale and scope of really the global political economy of what Nazarbayev, his family and allies actually took from the country. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex, and thanks to all of our panelists. So many interesting issues on the table here. Um, uh, the last one really uh, pointing to the fact that we never know where these protests will lead. Um, so what starts out small in one city can have really massive implications over the years. Uh, so I'd like to just, while people, oh, first let me invite the audience and thank you for coming today. Let me invite you to write your question in the Q&A box. Um, and while you're getting your questions together, let me throw out two kind of broad questions for our panelists and um, whoever wants to pick them up, um, either one or the other. Um, the first question um, continues uh, with um, this focus on CSTO, but actually I wanna ask about the effect on possible uh, popular opinion in Kazakhstan um, of the Russia's decision and Belarus's decision to um, send CSTO troops to Kazakhstan. Uh, so Alexander Baunov of Carnegie Moscow had a piece where he said this is this could, this is going to move public opinion against Russia. Um, but I just kind of wonder about that. I'd like to hear what the specialists have to say about that because um, there's two directions we could go in here. One is we know that in Ukraine, not all public opinion turned against Russia as a result of something you know arguably mu much more significant annexation of Crimea and war in Donbas, although uh, many people did. But even um, but even there, there's there are many sympathizers um, and people who support Russia's policy in Ukraine. Um, and then you know is it, could could you foresee something like that in Kazakhstan or um, and or what kind of effect might this have on uh, ethnic Russian minority, if any? Um, in Kazakhstan, and if anyone wants to pick up on uh, the, the the broader, more general theme of ethnic Russian minority um, in Kazakhstan um, and their role, if any, in the in this crisis, that would be great. Um, and then the the other question is that I have is about regional variation. So you know why why regional variation variation in these in the protests? Why did they start in certain cities? Um, Colleen mentioned. Um, the oil, um, the oil cities, and she mentioned um, 
Genosian, and we know that there's been, you know, a past history there. So to what degree does do events of the past, and I don't want to step on the, the toes here of our um, of our master's student, uh, Natalie Hall, who's here today and is probably going to ask about this, but I just, and is work, working on her master's thesis on um, this subject, but I, I just wonder um, if you have a uh, Oh my gosh, have I been muted this entire time? No? Just the last two seconds. <laughs> That's strange. Okay, so so where I left off. So the, um, yeah, so what are your thoughts on the variation and uh, what role maybe um, activists versus history versus popular opinion um, plays in why uh, the, there are more significant um, degrees of, of protests in certain cities rather than others. Okay, um, so while you're um, thinking about that, I'll take a look at the Q&A and, and then we'll have a broader conversation. So if anyone wants to, you know, jump in and, and offer their thoughts on um, my two questions before we turn to the general audience. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on, on that. First of all, it's very notable that ethnic minorities, including Russians, really don't tend to get in, involved in protests. And I mean, I've noticed that very often. I'm not, not to say they don't get involved at all, especially in cities like Almaty, but, you know, protests are very ethnic, Kazakh dominated. Um, I mean, street protests. And the only, the only thing I can, I mean, the only explanation I can really offer for that is that, you know, there is this perception that um, Kazakhs are first among equals in Kazakhstan for all the rhetoric of ethnic harmony, just as Russians were first among equals in the Soviet Union. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, it's a question of whether minorities feel that they own, own the country, whether they feel strongly enough about what happens there to protest and, um, and whether they feel they kind of have the right in inverted commas to protest. I mean, that's, that's, just, a, that's just my thoughts. I have no proof for, for any of that. And uh, just a couple of thoughts on the regional variations um, in, in how and why prote you know, protests were bigger or smaller or non-existent in some places. I think, you know, I mean, I think it, it, it can be to do with um, anything from the socioeconomic conditions in which people are living to the character of the people or the town. I mean, that doesn't sound very scientific, but, you know, let's face it, Nur Sultan um, is a much staider place than Almaty. It's, um, it's full of... Um, officials, bureaucrats, people who work for the state, people who work for the government, their livelihood depends on it. They're not really going to take to the streets. And that's why we really saw almost nothing in Nur Sultan. Um, Almaty, obviously, but always well known for its protest potential. But also, you know, I mean, um, you know, Zhang Ozen was big right at the start, and that's always known for its protest potential as well. Um, and, um, you know, uh, a city like Shimkent as well. Um, I think what's striking is we, we really saw protests in places where we very rarely see them normally. Talgar, for example, the, the regional capital of Almaty region. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, my, my answers aren't very scientific. Those are just my observations. I'm sure maybe someone else has something to add. There's one, one uh, um, observation I would make is um, about, about why the West in particular um, is I think uh, typically more inclined to uh, protests or kind of um, not civil unrest I and mean, kind of sh sh shows of dissent. This being the um, the oil rich part of the country, which is where all the oil is is uh, dug up from the ground. Um, workers movements are quite strong over there, and uh, and in fact so strong that the government is taking pretty uh, concerted efforts to clamp down un uh, unlawful um, unions. I mean, this is something I reported on quite a bit in, in the past few years. Um, so what, what the government does is it creates this kind of ersatz, kind of, uh, you know, parastatal unions, but which do not obviously have real functions of the union. And so, um, and, and nonetheless, um, workers tend to not be cowed by this kind of uh, intimidatory uh, policy. And so um, I think the unions, uh, Workers groups account for a lot of the sort of the organized nature of protests, in, in specifically in Jano Zen, which is where the first protests are. I think that um, that is a particularly, you know, quote unquote, troublesome town, but it's troublesome because it's, it's, it's a very kind of informally unionized town. Um, and, uh, and uh, kind of self organization is very strong there. I mean, j just to um, address your first question incidentally I mean I, I would obviously defer to Joe on this I mean I've not seen anything in uh, you know, Kazakh social media or, or you know, Kazakh the Kazakh commentariat which tends to primarily um, reside on 
social media, Telegram and so on, to suggest that the Russian, the CSDR presence in Kazakhstan has inspired particularly kind of strong feelings. I, I think that, that a certain a certain kind of liberal kind of slice of the, of the, of the, of the population maybe kind of takes umbrage a little bit, but that kind of um, anti kind of colonial kind of anti Russian sentiment is, is I would say pretty marginal one. Joe may, may want to correct me. Um, but in general, specifically to this uh, intervention, I've not seen there been no protests, no, no particularly strong um, uh, demonstrations of antipathy towards uh, Russia or towards the CSTO deployment. So I, I don't think that's um, a particularly pressing issue. I just want to piggyback off of that, um, specifically on this question about whether there's resentment towards ethnic Russians and Russia broadly as a former colonial power and for sending the CSTO troops. I mean, I think what, what I was really struck by was the inclination of Western observers who maybe don't, aren't as tapped into Kazakhstani politics to try to apply an ethnic lens to this, which makes sense. I mean, I think that the, the narrative around Ukraine for the past um, eight years has been one of Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers, who feels Russian, who feels Ukrainian. And with that, people who study the region, I think, are kind of drawing to make comparisons, not out of like malintent, but just because it feels familiar. It's in the same neighborhood. Um, but I think what's really telling here, there is, a, I would argue, a linguistic angle to this and a kind of ethno-national angle, but it has really nothing to do with Russia. The, the language element that I want to introduce was that I was really struck having um, done pretty like deep digital ethnographic analysis of unrest in Kyrgyzstan in October 2020 comparing to this, was that all of the local coverage of, of Kyrgyzstan was happening in Kyrgyz language. It was really hard to find Russian language posts, videos, speeches, Whereas in Kazakhstan this time, the president gave almost all of his speeches entirely in Russian, maybe one sentence at the beginning and like weirdly accented Kazakh. It sounded really strange. None of the telegram channels that were somehow able to get around the internet shutdown, none of them were posting in Kazakh, uh, except for one, Asiam Japishova was um, doing both Russian and Kazakh language coverage at the same time. But like the, the Russian language, if anything, this crisis demonstrated the extent to which there is a kind of silo of, of Russian versus Kazakh language media in the country, um, and, and that it does ultimately lean Russian speaking. Um, but the the kind of relevant ethnic cleavage that I want to bring up actually is Kyrgyz Kazakh um, contention. And I think that there's a lot of um, push to analyze, oh, these are both Turkic speaking countries. They're really similar culturally. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration there. But we, we've seen in the past few years that there are tensions geopolitically between Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. There was uh, that whole thing over Kyrgyzstan's presidential election in 2017. Um, there was have been multiple instances where the Kazakhstan just shuts down the border for trade overnight, causing huge economic problems for farmers and traders in Kyrgyzstan. But what I was struck by is seeing online a lot, both from, from Kyrgyzstan, but also then when the internet was back up, Kazakhs posting on social media that they felt a kind of like betrayal at their Kyrgyz brothers agreeing to send, I mean, granted it was 150 troops in the end, which is nothing compared to Russia's 3000, but a, a sense of betrayal of like, okay, you're in the CSTO with us, but like, why are you sending uh, troops over? And I think that this kind of ethnic cleavage of Kyrgyz Kazakh relations was then ramped up as as Kazakhstani authorities tried to throw Kyrgyz uh, protesters under the bus when Tokayev is grasping at straws trying to explain, okay, who are the terrorists? Who are the bandits? The first person arrested and, and thrown on TV was a Kyrgyz jazz musician, a jazz pianist who was in the wrong place at the wrong time, tortured and had a forced confession on TV that, ah, oh, yes, I orchestrated the protests. I think that here we see that the, the Kazakh government is playing on these stereotypes of the Kyrgyz brothers are more wild, less stable than us. Um, that if we're going to be watching for any sort of what are the geopolitical and, and social dynamics of the CSTO troops, it's going to be between Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, not Russia and Kazakhstan. Okay, great. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, all right, let me, we have a lot of questions here. I'm going to combine some of the questions and probably group. Um, uh, throw out two questions at a time um, in interests of, of getting to um, our questions and in the interest of time. Uh, the first two uh, questions by Olja Shaikhanov, I would like to group together. 
Um, are there legal implications for Turkayev's shoot to kill order now or later and what counts as a piece of evidence? And then relatedly, he asks why the US government is not openly condemning the Kazakh regime for killing and torturing people in Kazakhstan. Um, okay, uh, and then um, um, a question for, another question probably for Professor Cooley since that one was about geopolitics, the US response. Can Kazakhstan really walk away from multi-vectorism given the influence of Chevron in the oil and gas industry? Um, and hasn't Tokayev explicitly signaled a continued policy of encouragement for foreign investment? And that question was from Matthew Heaney. Um, yeah, should I take a stab at that? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, I wouldn't conflate sort of Chevron with multi-vectorism, right? I mean, I think the, the, the more pertinent question for investors is, you know, how are the assets going to be chopped up if the Nazarbayev family is really being pushed out, right? I think that's the question. I think Russia is sort of the secondary concern here. Um, and it's interesting, right? So, you know, Kulabayev's empire in the oil and gas network is pretty vast. Um, he has so far kept his Gazprom board seat, um, but um, he has been pushed out of some other positions. And, and so we'll see if that you know, that, that sticks. Um, look, I mean, I think here's what I'll say on multivectorism. It's not as if, you know, these countries don't want to pursue multivectorism. It sounds great. <laughs> you know, we do business with everyone. We have great relations with China, with the West, with the EU, with Russia. The point is that where does the ability to practice multivectorism come from? And it comes from like some pretty structural preconditions of power. So let's just be blunt. Security cooperation with the US and the Afghanistan campaign is one of those structural vectors. Absent that, it's not clear what that Western orientation is. Now you can talk about some of these investments from the 1990s being there. The fact of the matter is a lot of Western companies are trying to unravel their holdings in Kazakhstan, not get in on it. Um, and in fact, you know, positions have been sold over the last few years to Chinese companies, if anything. So, you know. The third vector for a while, in my estimation in Kazakhstan, was more kind of a kind of a global vector, right? It was sort of, you know, looking to the Gulf, looking to Korea, looking to Japan and various sorts of also, you know, also, you know, sort of cultural associations or, you know, alternative public goods providers to sort of, you know, China. Um, but I'm really struck by, um, you know, our inability to sort of look at the CIA, and I'm not impugning this to the questioner, but but our inability to look at the CSDO intervention as anything except a Cold War legacy, right? I've heard Warsaw Pact-like, right? So we had some pieces sort of, you know, comparing to that. Um, you know, you know uh, 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 this sort of sense that, you know, Takayev was absolutely forced into this, right? <laughs> Whereas he's the one who sort of, you know, um, really invoked it for his own sort of personal survival reasons. So um, look, regimes, are made in crises, just like states are made in war, right? And, and, and crises matter. And so, you know, none of us have as a crystal ball to be able to say how this is gonna play out, but to sort of just kind of dismiss it and say, well, you know, Takayev will naturally rebalance. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, but I wanna see then what that leverage is for that multi-vectorism to become reestablished. Does someone want to take uh, the other question about America's response or um, consequences for Takaya? I mean, I think that that is sort of a related question. I mean, th th there are some very faint echoes in what has happened on this instance. And this is, uh, I think, related to Oz Justice's other question about whether uh, there will be legal ramifications for the shoot to order uh, instructions. There are faint echoes of, of Uzbekistan. Uh, 2005 here. Um, so there was a, uh, what was similar about the dynamic there was that was an organic protest that became something um, more sinister when it kind of got hijacked by um, um, violent actors and the, 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 um, the army came in and sort of just sort of shot at people indiscriminately. And in, um, in the wake of that, Western governments, EU and uh, the United States were much more vocal than they're being about Kazakhstan today, much more vocal about, uh, vocal about wanting independent investigations, pushed and pushed and pushed, at which point um, the then president, Karimov of Uzbekistan, who was a very much 
uh, non multi vector guy who was very much kind of um, monogamous in his kind of international uh, relations. So uh, uh, he kind of um, decided kind of there and then, having made friends with the West uh, post 9 11, that okay, he was sick of his. Uh, Westerners telling him what to do, uh, just pretty much kind of walked away from that and um, and kind of sort of threw in his love with Russia at that point. That's maybe slightly overstating the point. Um, so, um, so potentially something similar could happen, say, with uh, Kazakhstan, although I don't actually see the West kind of pushing that much. I think that um, uh, Kazakhstan is a good friend to the West and, and, and uh, economic relations and uh, diplomatic relations are too sort of now kind of entrenched and well developed for the West to be making excessively loud noises. So I don't anticipate that happening. Why doesn't it happen? In, whatever, <laughs> the reality of uh, international relations, I think. Whether there'll be uh, legal repercussions, uh, not in Kazakhstan, um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, um, this sort of human rights dimension theoretically could could have had kind of implications for where how kind of Kazakhstan triangulates with uh, with all its kind of international partners but I don't see it I mean I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little less uh, gloomy on the whole kind of uh, I personally consider multi-vectorism to be irritating terms and uh, devised so I'm not not a fan it just means making friends with everyone it's more often just say that instead of multi-vectorism um, but uh, I did, there's nothing in Kazakhstan in, in President Tokayev's statements in recent days to suggest that he's backing away from that posture. Um, indeed, I think this has been alluded to in question. His, his, his priority has been very much in you know, making nice for foreign investors and so on. And so, so, and I know that's not, that's kind of slightly unrelated issue, maybe to the kind of the, the grand kind of geopolitics of kind of diplomacy. Um, Nevertheless, I think it, it, it's, it's, it sends a strong signal as to, as to the fact that Kazakhstan still sees itself as kind of this sort of country that engages with all of its partners kind of as equals. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let me um, mention two questions in the same breath. So. An anonymous attendee asks, do we know anything definite about the details of the coup attempt? If it was really organized by Nazarbayev, what about Tokayev's administration provoked Nazarbayev to attempt to resume power? And a very different question from Harriman postdoc Paula Ganga. What role is COVID playing in the developing situation? Has it made it easier for the government to keep possible protesters home? Um, or maybe trends when public disinformation started under COVID impacted the protests? Um, if anyone wants to take either of those, just feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I can say a couple of words on both of those. Um, the details of the coup, the whole point is that Takar has been very vague about what, what he thinks um, happened. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly he doesn't want to say who he thinks tried to overthrow him, which leads us to suspect that those were some very powerful people. As for it being Nazarbayev, I can't think that 81 year old Nazarbayev suddenly plotted a coup and thought he'd seize power again. I mean, if anything, um, it certainly would, it certainly um, withstands logical argument, the idea that people that his relatives or people who thought they might lose out when he eventually leaves the political scene might have plotted something. I'm not saying they did. Uh, but Nazarbayev himself, I don't think so. Um, and as for the COVID, um, you know, I mean, Kazakh authorities have spent 20, 30 years suppressing protests. They don't need the excuse of COVID. <laughs> um, you know, they've, they've constantly made many arrests um, on the grounds of breaching um, legislation governing public assembly. Tokayev says he's liberalized it, and he certainly sort of took a few measures um, uh, to make it a little bit less difficult to protest. 
Um, but still, protesters could be arrested for not have, for not asking for permission ten day, for not for not notifying the authorities ten days in advance and not going to agreed places. So all of those protesters who took to the streets basically um, in early January were were illegal anyway. So there's no need for COVID for extra to to, to have an excuse. I mean, certainly ban, um, there have been bans on marches and so on protests during um, COVID lockdowns. Um, sometimes people have flouted them. Sometimes they've got arrested. But I don't think I don't think I think the government has so many to at its disposal to thwart public protest that it doesn't need the excuse of, of COVID. I would add on, I think, I think the COVID question touched on disinformation, if I, if I, under, if I heard correctly, and I think that's a kind of, it's a really important point to dwell on that, because although Kazakhstan has a very poor, uh, weak media system, it has a very vibrant um, disinformation system. Um, social media are uh, used very widely and, and generally believed and trusted, I think that's sort of subjective analysis, but uh, uh, my hunch is uh, trusted and, and believed much more widely than state media is. And so um, that was you know, a, a big problem in, uh, in COVID times, kind of anti-vax sentiment was reasonably strong in, in, uh, in Kazakhstan. And, um, and and I don't doubt that um, that, that, it, that social media uh, and, and messaging apps and, and, and that type of technology had a very important role to to play in this particular crisis. I mean, I, I know that's not addressing the COVID thing, but uh, but I, I think it's 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 useful to think about disinformation as as, as um, I'm not saying disinformation caused the protest, but, but what I mean is that um, uh, you know that, that, that sometimes sentiments are kind of quickly whipped up um, through um, the kind of exchange of, of um, unverified information, and I think that, that uh, the, the impact of that will be uh, very interesting for the study. Okay, um, well, I'll move along here in the interest of time. Uh, Eric Fisher, we addressed many of the panelists, addressed many of the first question. Second question is, thank you for your insights. What comparative analysis would you draw between today's protest of Kazakhstan and, and the Kyrgyz protests in 2020? And uh, what are your views on the current situation now that it's been 1.5 years from the revolution in Kyrgyzstan? Uh, so, so that focuses a little bit more on Kyrgyzstan than maybe our panelists are prepared to. Um, so let me add the, another question from Roman Vasilenko and, and panelists can decide how to address these questions. Um, okay, Roman says, listening to the comments of the panelists, I was wondering how much of a time gap or how much time people abroad are willing to give Tokayev in, in um, expecting him to enact changes in terms of a resolving the issue of poverty and building up a fairer system of redistribution of wealth or introducing political reforms. Um, so would it be a very short period of time or a few months or um, interested in what Roman means by people abroad uh, and whether they have uh, ability to constrain Tokayev. So if anybody wants to um, discuss, return to the, okay, Colleen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that they're kind of connected questions that, that if I'm to, to answer the comparative analysis, I mean, I think it's not really the time or space to talk about Kyrgyzstan, but um, one point that I had thought of while, while Peter was giving his initial points or thoughts was about kind of what political reform might actually look like in Kazakhstan. And um, one space where this might look kind of like things that have happened in Kyrgyzstan in the last year is um, the potential for a, a party landscape that maybe is different in name only. So if Nuratan crumbles um, and a handful of the either pre-existing parties that are opposition or show up in parliament are going to take its place, if there's going to be some sort of a new party um, infrastructure that replaces it, I think that it's going to be important to look at names. So one of the lessons from studying Kyrgyzstan for not only the last 1.5 years, but the last 30 um, is that power and elites is basically just a big game of musical chairs that, you know, the, the names of the parties, the names of who or what is in charge might change, but it's, it's eerie, the kind of repetition of the names of individuals. I think that we even might see this if there is, uh, you know, as Roman asked, how much time are people going to be giving to Kaya for political reforms? That it's one thing to 
introduce the kind of electoral institutional reforms that people are demanding, that they want to be able to elect their Akim, the executive at the city level and at the oblast level. Um, but, you know, as we saw this past summer that Kazakhstan for the first time allowed the direct election of Akim's for village councils. But when you look at the actual number of what are the names and what's the party affiliation of the people that were voted in, um, sure, there was a choice. Sure, the electoral um, reform was instituted, but in the vast majority, I think it was something 80, 85 percent of the new Akims were already Akims before, and there are they're still associated with Neuroton. So even if Tokayev does kind of make this space of, oh, we're going to have reform, we're going to change things, now everyone gets to choose who parliament is, No, Neuroton is no longer. I wouldn't be surprised if very similar to Kyrgyzstan, there's this kind of illusion of, ah, oh, look, we have a new party name, but the same people are going to be in charge. And we've already seen that. Tokayev asked the government to resign. Less than a week later, 11 of the 20 um, ministers are just reappointed to their same position. But Tokayev gets to ride that wave of, but I, I asked them to resign. We have a new government now. Um, so I think it'll be a matter of, I don't, I don't think that there will be a lot of patience for um, this in the long run. So even if it takes a little while to introduce the institutional reform, if, if it isn't followed up with new people, um, that's where we might see more um, leverage for grievances. Yeah, I don't think the fundamental tensions between a global oligarchic elite that is increasingly taking more of the country's wealth and sort of domestic demands for economic justice are gonna be resolved anytime soon without very deep structural reforms, which I just don't think Takayev is gonna make. I think the, you know, the, the political pressure is going to be to take over some of these rent seeking positions. I mean, you know, just a reminder, there's according to KPMG uh, report a couple of years ago, there's 162 Kazakhs that own half the country's wealth right? <laughs> like, just to sort of talk about just structural kind of inequality here. There are, um, you know, Kazakhstan was uh, the fifth largest recipient of tier one investor visas in the UK, right? 42 of them um, uh, obtained investor visas, the right to live in the UK, um, you know, most of them off that list. So the Kazakh elite has already hedged, right? They have the ability to live overseas to keep their assets. This report, I was a, on a team co-authorship for Chatham House, you know, we identified over half a billion pounds worth of luxury real estate investments, um, or rather real estate holdings in central London, owned by the Kazakhs, and over 300 million of that um, is owned by sort of the family itself. So, you know, the, 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 the disconnect, right, between these sort of domestic demands where, you know, in the face of spiking prices, you know, constant or diminishing wages, um, and then what's going on abroad um, is, is really striking. And just back to Paula's question, the pandemic, the pandemic in Kazakhstan, as in most other countries in the world, just offered increased opportunities for those with access to sort of, you know, state funds in the name of COVID to become richer. So that Forbes billionaire list in Kazakhstan, I think went from five to seven over COVID. So, you know, uh, uh, all of this is, is, is gonna be a, a really tough haul. Um, but, you know, my sense is that, um, you know, this hedge that has been made by the, I will use the word oligarch, right? Um, but but, but, but by, by the Kazakh, you know, elite oligarchs, is for this moment, <laughs> right? This is what they made the hedge for now, right? So that they have the option to come back or to stay abroad and live in London and Geneva, New York, um, if they have to. So again, this puts pressure on Takayev, like how much does he really wanna go after the circle that's, that's abroad where really um, they have uh, the portfolio assets that um, a lot of these grievances are about. I think though, I Alex. Just, um, sorry. Oh, sorry, carry up. Okay. Just go, I go, just go, go. You go first. You go first. But I'm you're muted. muted. <laughs> Joanna, you're muted. Um, 
Sorry, I was just going to address Roman's question very quickly because um, nice to see you, Roman, uh, Roman Vasilenko, asking how long people abroad are prepared to give to Kyiv. Roman, um, if you forgive me saying something, that's the wrong question. How long are the people of Kazakhstan prepared to give to Kyiv to deliver something? I mean, as Alex has just said, deep structural reforms required economically, politically, and socially. Um, it's a, a huge job that Tokayev is taking on if he means it. Um, but it's not about what people abroad are prepared to give him, but his own people. I just wanted to pick up on something Alex was saying about the, the 162 uh, people controlling uh, more than half the wealth of uh, Kazakhstan. I mean, that, this sort of ties in with the question about how long people will give to Tokayev. Tokayev gives the impression of wanting to work very fast. He mentioned that figure himself. He alluded to KPMG's uh, um, assessments on uh, inequality in the Kazakh economy. And so, I mean, he's sort of conveying two things. One, that he's going to, he's making sort of inferences that he's going to move in on those kind of uh, uh, assets, whether or not he does it. It's another matter, uh, but that um, this is you know, a kind of a clearly a top priority for him. Um, I, the things Roman asks, uh, how quickly will Tokayev, you know, solve poverty? I think that's kind of sort of the, the gist of his question. I mean, obviously, nobody is expecting him to do that. Um, what people are expecting him to do is to to speak seriously about uh, structures um, and uh, political reform and and. You know, there's no time like the present. I think that if he is not able to do it seriously, even the day after tomorrow, while he's got a chance to speak at the uh, uh, the Congress of the ruling party, then uh, then it, 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 it'll show that he's uh, not seriously committed to, to an actual reform season. That he's just paying lip service. Okay, uh, let me just offer any of the other panelists uh, the opportunity to make concluding remarks. Um, if not, Colleen, do you, is there anything else you wanted to say? I guess for, in terms of concluding remarks, I'm struck, you know, that a lot of the, the themes that we're hearing about Kazakhstan and about the violence there, you know, deep frustration and distrust in the state for being able to manage um, huge inequality, the kind of hiding away of state wealth, um, legal but improper approach to um, distributing state funds and and resource wealth that I'm just that th these aren't specific to Kazakhstan and this type of unrest we've been seeing this all throughout the pandemic of countries around the world of this kind of mass unrest in response to corruption inequality and and even that this isn't necessarily something that's specific to autocracies or specific to um kind of post dictatorships or this authoritarian transition that a lot of our, our takeaways are things that we can be thinking about in the countries that we come from um speaking of the panelists at least um and just i think that it's it's useful to kind of get away from the kind of authoritarianism angle of this from the this is just central asia and how central asia and governments work, um, but kind of looking at, as Alex has pointed out over and over, that this is broader global networks that the West is deeply involved of and, and that the West faces among its own publics. So I hope that we can be thinking um, globally as well as drawing on really rich um, on the ground analysis uh, that, that the journalists have been able to provide. Thank you, Colleen. And I would like to thank each of our panelists. I think we've covered a lot of territory here. Uh, the questions were great. Um, I hope that uh, the, the panelists addressed um, many of them. And thank you everyone for coming. Please attend some of our upcoming talks at Harriman that are very responsive to um, critically developing events in the region. Um, and Justin, is there anything you would like to say in conclusion? No, thank you very much all for attending. And uh, it's been a pleasure that Eurasianet could be uh, a co-host for this event. Thank you again. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.